session on atheism and secular humanism. Uh, in this assignment, you will find a Google Doc. It looks just like this. Uh, I've given each one of you a copy of this Google document, um, which means you can edit it. And as you edit it, that will be your submission. Uh, this will be the, uh, the second page of this document. It has a place for you to insert scriptural refutations uh, for different atheistic thoughts and ideas. Uh, and so you'll be able to just edit the document straight there and return it. You don't have to print uh, or anything like that. Um, so with that, uh, you'll need a, a copy of the doc or have the doc available. Take your notes on a normal piece of paper, but you can incorporate your notes into the document. And so uh, with uh, atheism and secular humanism, I have set it up just like previously. Um, first of all, um, setting up a series of words that are unique to that, um, that belief system. In this situation, atheism. A disbelief, in, a disbelief in the existence of gods. Secular. Secular means refrain, uh, referring to those things that have no religious or spiritual basis. Humanism. A system of thought making man of prime importance rather than a divine or supernatural uh, deity. Um, then there's some evolutionary uh, uh, terms there that we'll get into later uh, in the next lesson. But uh, the last one I want to hit on is naturalism, the theory defining that anything ha um, that uh, denying that anything has supernatural significance, specifically the doctrine that scientific laws are adequate to account for all phenomena. Uh, in the Truth Project, Dr. Del Tackett uses a great um, visual, and, and I've got one here. He uses a black box, and the, the black box is to represent the natural world. All of the cosmos, everything that makes up what we would call the natural universe or the physical universe, exists inside the box. All right, so all space, all time, all energy, all matter is inside the box. And so outside the box, there's nothing. So the atheist or the agnostic or the secular humanist, a naturalist, believes everything is inside the box and everything can be explained exclusively by what's inside the box. There's nothing and no one outside the box. It is only the natural physical universe that exists. And so hopefully that helps you visualize the concept of the natural universe and naturalism. So normally in this front section here, uh, I give you uh, an understanding of what that worldview believes. But in general, atheism doesn't believe in a whole lot of things. In fact, it's the lack of belief um, in fact, I took that um, according to the American Atheist website. It says this, quote, Atheism is not a belief system. It is the lack of belief in gods. So I can't really go into what they believe so much. I'll just go into the primary arguments that atheists have against the existence of God or against Christianity. Now, I can speak just slightly to beliefs. Um, an atheistic evolutionary worldview has specific consequences that are rarely acknowledged, but uh, William Provine, uh, an atheist and an evolutionist, was, was candid about the, um, the consequence of this belief. He stated that, uh, that under atheism, number one, no gods worth having exist. Number two, because of that, no ultimate foundation for ethics exist. If there's no moral lawgiver, then there's no moral law. If there's no moral law, then essentially there are no real or true morals. Number three, no life exists after death. This is all you get. And if there's no life after death, then number four, there is no ultimate meaning in life because everything is so fleetingly temporary. In fact, Jean-Paul Sartre, um, a French philosopher, said this, Man is a useless passion. It is meaningless to live, and it is meaningless to die. This is the natural conclusion um, of atheism. And number five, human free will therefore does not exist. If there's really no choice, um, if there's really no ultimate meaning, then free will is just an illusion. So, um, but that's about all we can say about what atheists believe, because they're non-believists, right? So let's look at the primary arguments. There's three of them that I want to address real quickly. The first secular argument that comes against the idea specifically of Christianity is that it's religion that causes wars and violence and evil in the world. It's the Christian's fault. Um, the British zoologist Richard Dawkins, you've probably heard of him, 
He says this, quote, Religion causes wars by generating certainty. But is this statement true? Um, have the death and the wars and the atrocities upon the planet been primarily the result of believing in a god? Well, I went to Wikipedia, and I give you this here on your page. In Wikipedia, I looked up the major Judeo-Christian conflicts from, from all of time. And I placed them there, on, and, and their general death tolls. The death tolls that were published in Wikipedia. And if you notice that after the French, the death of the Canaanite conquest and the Crusades and the Inquisitions and the wars of religion um, um, between Protestant and Catholic, when you get down to the bottom and you add these all up, what you have is approximately 6.3 to 20 million deaths attributable um, to Judeo-Christianity, which is extremely horrible and unfortunate. And a good portion of these, um, I think, were done in Jesus' name, but definitely um, blasphemed the name of Jesus in, in, in the process. But now let's look at atheism, because atheism kind of makes this accusation saying, but we are guiltless. Well, starting in 1920 with Lenin and Stalin and the Soviet crimes, Hitler's death camps of the Holocaust, Mao Zedong uh, in, the, in the killing fields, Pol Pot, Cambodian genocide, when you add up the death toll of these um, uh, of, of these encounters, of, of these wars, after 50 years, we have 62 to 159 million deaths. So in the course of Judeo-Christianity, after three millennia th and, 300, and three centuries, 3,300 years, we have at the top 20 million deaths. In atheism, after just 50 years, we have 159 million deaths. So I don't think it's very honest to say that Judeo-Christianity, or a belief in the certainty of religion, somehow is what's causing all of the problems on the planet. I think that's a pretty hypocritical and uneducated um, assertion. Secular argument number two. Evil proves there is no God. Now, the Greek philosopher Epicurus is extremely famous for this. It's been restated in a number of different ways, and you may have heard something to this effect. Um, but this is his syllogism. His syllogism uh, is a proof against the existence of God. It goes like this. If God is willing to prevent evil, but he is not able, then he's not all-powerful. If God is able, but he's not willing to prevent evil, then he is malevolent. If he is both able and willing, then why is there evil? And if he's neither able nor willing, then why would you call him God? very well said um, as, as you take it at face value. But that's the problem. You shouldn't take this at face value because this is a rhetorical tool called framing the argument. And in framing the argument, it limits the discussion. Much in the same way, the question, have you stopped beating your mother, limits the discussion. You see, for you to answer that question, I just need a simple answer, yes or no. Have you stopped beating your mother? You have to presume my assumption that you beat your mother at all. And in the same way here, this says that God is defined exclusively by being all-powerful and all-good. But where has that ever been established as the complete definition or the complete description of who God is? Is God simply all-powerful and all-good? Or is he also eternal and holy and all-knowing and gracious and merciful, these additional characteristics on the nature of God completely changes the discussion. Let me show you how. <coughs> if God is also, in addition to being all-powerful, in addition to being benevolent, if he's also all-knowing and eternal, then it's extremely possible and probable that any temporary evil or suffering can be justified by some other eternal reward. That God in his ultimate knowledge and holiness and in his eternality can judge to allow an evil to continue to exist because there is a greater good that will result from it. That's a very logical conclusion that is not allowed by Epicurus's uh, initial uh, syllogism. And so, uh, so generally, you've got to be careful. Many times, um, atheists will be quite um, well-spoken but, um, so, so, well, okay, I don't want to use that word. They are manipulating the argument. And so you have to drop back and see, is there a bigger, uh, is, there, is there more at play than what is involved in, in their assertion? 
Um, all right, let's get into the last one. Secular argument number three. There is no science proof, scientific proof that there's a God. Thomas Edison said this, I have never seen the slightest scientific proof of the religious theories of heaven and hell, of a future life for individuals, or of a personal God. And so what we have to do is there's no scientific proof for the existence of God. Is the scientific method the tool that we use to prove the existence or to disprove the existence of God? I believe it's the wrong tool. It would be like saying, I have looked through every telescope on the planet and I have not yet seen any proof that there are microbes. Well, you would say, well, that's because you're using the wrong tool. You see, the scientific proof and scientific method is only good for observing the natural universe as it exists right now. Um, there are a lot of things that scientific science cannot prove. And I gave you five of them here on your paper. Five categories of truth that cannot be proven by the scientific method. The first, existential truth. Science can't prove that you exist or that the world exists and that this is not just merely a dream or a perception. However, it's still pretty rational to believe that you exist. It's pretty rational to believe that the, that the world exists. Second, moral truths. Science can never prove that rape is evil or that helping someone is good. Science can describe how the world is, but not how the world ought to be. Science cannot say anything about morality. Science cannot prove logical truths. Science, um, consider the statement, science is the only way to really know truth. The problem is, is how could you prove that statement with science? You can't. Science presupposes logic. It presupposes truth for its own very own existence, but it cannot prove it. Uh, number four, historical truth. Science cannot prove any historical event. Um, the method for proving his, uh, historical events is completely different. It's called it's the historical method, and, and um, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's a, the legal argument. And um, historical truths can't be proven scientifically because they're non-repeatable. Remember, the scientific method is based upon experiment and adjusting the terms of the experiment and observing what happens during the course of that experiment. How can you do that with a historical event? It only happens once and it's gone. You can't prove history with science. Last of all, uh, experiential truth. Science cannot prove love or beauty or belief. Um, there is no scientific test that can confirm or deny these experiential realities that really make up the better portion of our life. So to say that scientific, that God cannot be proven by science um, is, is kind of like saying, I'm not going to believe God is invisible until I see him. Uh, it's, it's kind of a foolish argument. If you could see him, he wouldn't be invisible. Uh, actually, it would be more than that. It would be like a blind man saying, I won't believe in God until I see him. First of all, he doesn't have the capacity to see, and even if he had the capacity to see, uh, he can't see that which is invisible. And if he could see that which is invisible, then it would no longer be invisible. It's just, it's a silly argument. Sorry, I got uh, sidetracked there for a moment. Okay, now I've given you a series of atheistic statements. Um, I went looking through um, atheist quotes uh, to try to kind of put them into some categories. Uh, it was difficult to do, but they're here. Sam Harris says, if you were concerned about suffering in the universe, killing a fly should present uh, greater and more difficulty than killing a human blastocyte, which is a three-day human embryo. Um, is that true? Is that what God says? Does God say that, um, that uh, first of all, suffering in the universe is our primary concern, number one. Second, that killing a fly is of more moral difficulty than killing a child. Is that what the Bible says? Uh, next quote. Nevertheless, the main point is clear. Killing a disabled infant is not morally equivalent to killing a person. Very often, it's not wrong to kill that person. Uh, it's, not, it's not wrong to kill a disabled infant at all. That's Peter Singer. Is that what the Bible says? Does the Bible say that, uh, um, that uh, disabilities um, devalue life? It would be interesting to uh, see what you find there. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche says this, Just look at the faces of the great Christians. They are the faces of great haters. Um, is, that, is that what Jesus teaches? Is Christianity um, a hate-based religion? Uh, the next one, Ernest Hemingway, says, All thinking men are atheists. Is that true? Have all the great scientists and historians and artists and musicians, have all the great minds of history been atheists? It'd be interesting to find out. Uh, next one, Christopher Hitchens says this, To terrify children with an image of hell, to consider women as inferior creation, uh, is that good for the world? So is that what the Bible teaches? 
Does the Bible teach us to terrify children with the image of hell? Does the Bible teach us to consider women as inferior to men? Uh, let's see what you can find about that in the Bible. Uh, Sam Harris. We have a choice between conversation and war. That's it. Conversation and violence. And faith is a conversation stopper. Interesting. See if that's what you think is the, is the truth about Bible and Bible theologians and apologists. Um, is it, do we stop conversation? Or are these quotes stopping conversation? And the last one is one of my favorite quotes, uh, Richard Dawkins. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Jealous and proud of it, petty, unjust, unforgiving, a control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, maledic, uh, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capricious, malevolent bully. That's in the God delusion. Is that is that the God of the Bible? Um, I actually went through, and I've, I've done this exercise before, I actually took each and every one of those words and refuted each and every word with Scripture. I did a, a sermon on that at one point or another. Anyway, have fun with that one. It's, it's a great quote. So I don't know if you noticed, um, but there's an obvious tone to these atheist quotes. And, and I'm not being select. I'm not cherry picking here. Just go look up atheist quotes and you're just going to get a ton of them. And they all have this tone to them. They're very angry. They're very hostile. They're very pejorative. Um, they're, they're not nice. They're not nice. And, um, but that shouldn't surprise us. You know, when somebody cannot argue the merits of their position, very often they will attack the person who disagrees with them. And so uh, in trying to share your faith with an atheist, you may encounter a similar sense of disdain. And so I would encourage you not to argue with atheists. Um, uh, I would encourage you to just ask them questions. I find that this is the best approach. Just ask them honest questions. Questions, not leading questions, not manipulative questions. Just ask them honest questions and, and listen to their answers. Don't refute their answers. Let them say whatever they want to say because they hear what they're saying. And I have found this to be the best approach. In fact, what I've included here is 45 questions for non-believers. Um, there is a whole list of them here. Uh, I find that they're, uh, they're, they may not all fit you, your personality, um, or your style. But go through those 45 questions. They are quite fun. And, uh, and what I, my dare for you, or my assignment for you from this, since there's not a whole lot of note-taking here, is to take one of those questions, or more than one of those questions, but look through those 45, and grab a couple, and pose them to a non-believer, either in a phone call or a text. But please do it politely. Please do it respectfully. Don't do it as an aha. But really, seriously, if you know somebody and they're not a believer, you, you're probably burdened for them. You love them. You care about them. And you probably wonder sincerely, what, did, what, you know, what do they think about this question? So ask them, say, I've always wondered. I know you don't believe in God. What would be your answer to this? I found this question. This weird ball guy sent me a bunch of questions. What would be your answer to this question? And just listen. Don't argue. Just listen. Well, I hope that this is going to work good for you for theology this week. Um, this will be due the following Thursday, and so hope to talk to you soon. Bye.